my name is Debbie Moore. I'm 63 years old. Hard to believe, but I am. Today is August 17, 2012. We're in Bastrop, Texas. And I'll be talking with my friend, Jamaica. My name is Sarah Jamaica Moores. Uh, I am 34 years old. And today is August 17th. We're here in Bastrop, Texas. And I'm here talking with my friend, Debbie Moore. What we're here to talk about today was is um, the fires of Central Texas that started on Labor Day 2012, burned over 34,000 acres and destroyed just under 1,700 structures and mainly homes, and yours is one of them. Um, but before we talk about that, can you tell me what Jamaica's life was like before the, the fire? Um. Essentially, I guess it was how the story begins and how we got to Bastrop. Uh, my husband and I previously had lived uh, outside of Dallas in Irving, Texas, and um, we were together for um, 12 years and, uh, you know, had been going to school and, and kind of, you know, getting to where we wanted to be and find a place where we wanted to settle before we started our family. And um, I'd grown up coming to the Bastrop area. My grandparents live in Fayette County. And so growing up, I would come to the state park and knew of Bastrop and had relatives here in this county. And um, in 2005, we had come to Bastrop for a funeral of a family member. And uh, while we were here, we came downtown and walked Main Street and stopped at the coffee shop along the river. And it was there that we decided that Bastrop was the place we wanted to move to, that um, a more rural lifestyle, living out in the country, was what we wanted for our family. Um, so with that, we began looking. It took uh, 18 months for us to find the place that we, we were excited about, that um, we could afford and that, you know, we wanted to do um, more important than the home was the piece of property that we found. We really didn't care what was on it. We were after that piece of property that was right and perfect for us. And so um, we uh, bought some property out in Page, just outside of Bastrop. Uh, it was seven acres of um, pine and uh, loblolly pine and post oak forest and uh, it was just beautiful there's um, a little uh, runoff area that runs through the property a little creek and um, some elevation and it was absolutely beautiful and so when we moved um, to Bastrop it was for us you know, moving to an enchanted forest we were so excited just to be able to get out of the urban city um, when we that was when 2008 this was 2007 uh, seven. Uh, that we actually purchased the property um, at the time we left Dallas uh, I was working on the 40th floor of um, a high-rise downtown was taking the dart train and uh, working for attorneys and my husband was doing the same he was working for uh, doctors downtown Dallas and so it was complete lifestyle change for us to up and move um, from what we were doing to move here to Bastrop. And uh, once we got here, um, my husband began working in Austin, and um, I was fortunate enough to find a job here in Bastrop on Main Street. Um, it really was uh, a perfect world for me because I was able to make so many new friends by working in this small community um, with my, the, the lady that I was working for. She knew a lot of people in the community, and so, uh, it really instantly became home for us. Yeah. Uh, we joked about how walking down Main Street in Bastrop is like, you know, a step back in time. We walk in, you know, it could be Mayberry. Um, and for us, that was really exciting. Uh, just a nice, quaint, quiet place um, where we could start our family and raise our kids um, in the beautiful nature that is Bastrop. Um, so then I think your husband took on another project. Yes, um, so uh, we were, we basically were living here in Bastrop for about four years, um, had, you know, in that time uh, acquired new friendships, 
Um, I had begun my own uh, business being a freelance graphic designer uh, with the uh, new relationships and friendships that I made in Bastrop. Um, it would kept me busy with lots of different projects for people in town. And um, my husband had uh, gotten a new job in Austin and we uh, had our baby. We, you know, in 2009, we started our family and um, renovated our home, had built a guest cabin, had built a, a workshop. My husband enjoys doing sculpture. He's an artist. And um, so we had just gotten to a point where we felt like we had it made. Like we had, you know, I was able to stay at home with the baby. He got a great job. Things were just like there for us. And um, in um, Labor Day weekend of 2011, um, it was a Sunday. Um, uh, Rob was at home with our baby and I had come to town to go uh, grocery shopping. I was in town for a couple few hours uh, when I uh, loaded up the car with all the groceries and on my way home I could see a black plume of smoke in the sky in the direction of our home and immediately got panicked. Um, the day before I had received um, warnings uh, about uh, you know, high fire alert, high wind alerts, you know, cautioning us about high winds that were going to be happening Labor Day weekend. And so when I saw the smoke that Sunday, it was, you know, part of, you know, our worst fears happening in the fact that it was coupled with the high winds. And so... And the high temperatures and, and the, the high, rain. And the yeah. high temperatures and uh, um, the drought conditions that we had had all summer long. Um, so I, when I saw the smoke, I called my husband and, and asked him to get online and uh, to see if there were any postings on the emergency management. Uh, Bastrop County Emergency Management's Facebook had been doing updates about things that were happening in the areas and if fires were you know, breaking out, they would let the public know. Well, by the time um, I got near my home, I was able to actually pass up the fire uh, just to the south and made it home. Um, I had a friend that was actually in town 20 minutes behind me and by the time he tried to make it home, they had already shut off the road. Uh, the fire was spreading that quickly. By the time I got home, uh, there was a posting that the neighborhood next to ours was under um, mandatory evacuation due to the fire and within an hour or so, um, it was funny, I got home, we unloaded the van, we put all the groceries inside, and within an hour decided that we needed to leave too once um, the black smoke filled to the north of our home. And uh, we weren't told to leave, we weren't under any sort of you know, mandatory to leave, it was just a decision that we had made, being that you know, to the west and to the north of us, the um, smoke was filling the air. And so when we left, we really didn't leave with the intention that um, anything would necessarily happen to our home and property. I think um, overall we're really positive people and so you just don't imagine that something like that would happen. And uh, you know, my husband was actually the one saying, we, you know, we should leave, we should leave. And I was like, no, you know, everything's gonna be okay. You know, let's just wait it out a little bit longer. And he put his foot down and said, no, we're leaving. And so with that, we grabbed a change of clothes, um, our firebox of important papers, uh, some toys for the baby. And um, we left and evacuated to my grandparents' home in uh, Fayette County. And um, just kind of waited to see how things would unfold and so for two days um, we were in Fayette County just kind of listening to news reports and not really knowing anything that was happening. I was trying to find as much information as I could um, regarding our neighborhood and, and um, if we could go back in and um, then it, several more days passed. We still weren't allowed to come uh, back into the area. Uh, at that point, we left Fayette County and went to a friend's home in Austin. Um, that friend had a co-worker whose husband was DPS and uh, he was relayed our address 
And on the fifth day out, on that Friday, um, he was kind enough to go by uh, our address to check on it for us. And on that Friday, we received the news that uh, the home was a total loss. Um, so with that, um, it was, I don't know, it was sort of a surreal time. It, <clears throat> we didn't really, I don't know, it was hard to like process the fact, is this really happening? Is it really gone? What does this mean? Um, what's the condition of the property? Um, and so on the ninth day out, it was a Tuesday, we were at that point allowed to come back into the area um, to survey our property and see the damage of the home. So did you stay in Austin? Uh, we did. Um, at that point, we had a friend who actually had um, a vacation rental apartment that he had just finished out off of Congress Avenue. And so we ended up staying in uh, his apartment for two months after the fire, which was quite a change. Because yeah. we went from going from you know our house in the woods to being on Congress Avenue in Austin. Yeah. <laughs> so how long did it take you to rebuild your home? Actually, we haven't rebuilt our home You have yet. not? Okay. We have not. <clears throat> um, we, so we stayed in Austin for two months. At that point, we knew that we wanted to come back to our property, that we wanted to stay in Bastrop, that we wanted to rebuild. Um, so the arrangement we made was we had found um, a company in the area that uh, rents office construction trailers to construction companies. And so we contacted them and said, you know, hey, we've lost our home out in Bastrop. You know, is there any way that we can rent one of these units from you? And them understanding the need in the area for people to have something to live in, um, they agreed to it. So we ended up moving this office construction trailer onto our property where we then makeshifted a kitchen area. Um, it came with a bathroom and a shower already, so those elements were covered, but it's essentially a 10 by 40 trailer um, that's currently on our property. Uh, we made the decision to do that because it was temporary. They would move it in and move it off Yeah. while we made other plans to rebuild. Well, we lost a neighborhood of a couple million trees in the fire. Yeah. So tell everybody what you, you and your husband creatively came up with to get those fallen trees milled. So uh, the situation with the trees, I mean obviously like to my husband and I, um, the woods are very important. You know, like I said, our priority in moving here was finding that right piece of property. And so with the trees, I believe it, at first we were kind of in denial about the condition of them. You know, we, we like held out all hope until the spring to see if, if they would come back, if they would make it and survive. Um, on our property, uh, estimate that we have about 500 pine trees. And um, so once we, I guess, suppose, uh, it supposedly it, it came out of denial about the trees and really were like, you know, these trees are gone. What are we going to do? Um, when you're on a piece of property like that and you're surrounded by that kind of timber and, you know, and down the line it starts to become a falling hazard, uh, we knew we had to do something about it. And having a strong desire to utilize the trees and to make good use of them because we love loved them and didn't want to see them just rot and fall around us. Um, we decided that we needed to do something about it, that we wanted to clean up our land. Um, so we, we called around. We you know, called Texas Forestry Service. We called sawmills in East Texas. We tried to find out as much as we could about the trees and, and what can we do about this. And if you're in our situation and you have this you know, seven acres full of pine trees, what would you do? And, and it was really weird because we didn't get a lot of clear answers and um, uh, nobody, I don't know, there was no clear cut answer. There weren't logging companies knocking on our door saying, we'll pay you for your timber. Um, what we came to learn is that there's this 
weird situation happening in Bastrop County where for a long time these trees have been protected in a way and in another way we're um, an island forest so we're sort of removed from the timber industry of East Texas so therefore logistically and transportation costs it's not worth you know worth it to the East Texas loggers to come to our area to log these um, trees and harvest them and so I don't know, it was like our only option would be to like mill it, but then, you know, what is involved in that process of, you know, cutting down the trees and moving them and transporting them and then having to pay for the milling. And it was all very overwhelming to us. And we weren't quite sure, you know, what direction to take. And so in February, we met a gentleman who, uh, was in the area and his philosophy was that the trees should be utilized. Um, so he created this organization called Logs to Lumber. And when we start, <clears throat> first started initially talking to him, we decided that that was like the best bet that we could do was to try to get with this organization and see if we can't harvest these trees and you know at least use them to be milled or get them to the mill. And so the log to lumber organization, the main the main arrangement that he had made was with a logging or excuse me a, a mill in Huntsville, which is approximately 130 miles away. And so the arrangement with this mill was that if we could get them our burned timber, they would exchange it out for milled already milled lumber. And um, so kind of part of a of the story is in November, we had received a phone call um, from the Bastrop County on behalf of FEMA offering to come and help us clear the timber, probably around the house site area, not necessarily all seven acres. And uh, when my husband was talking to them, you know, he essentially expressed the opinion that no, we want our timber, that we consider it to be a, you know, a resource that we can utilize to rebuild our home. And at that time, <clears throat> The worker on the other end told him, well, you know that the, the wood is a construction grade. And so not understanding the terminology of the logging industry or the timber industry, we uh, you know, were under the assumption that these trees are no good. And so, and just different things that we were hearing from different people was that the quality of these trees isn't suitable for building. And at the same time, that was very conflicting for us because we know the history of these trees in this forest and the history of Bastrop and the historic homes that are standing here to this day. Built of that. Yeah, that exactly, lumber. that yeah. were built from these woods. And so when we met the Logs to Lumber organization, I guess for us at the time, it seemed like the best thing to do. Well, maybe this wood isn't good. Maybe our best bet would be to exchange out this burned timber for already milled lumber, East Texas lumber. And so <clears throat> moving forward in the process with the Logs to Lumber organization, essentially, you know, the organization is just this one elderly man in town, and he was trying to get the resources together to do this, but it's, it's you know, very much a ambitious undertaking to take on what is, you know, logging. I mean, all the way from cutting the trees to moving them. It's just, it's an incredible amount <clears throat> of work. And so seeing that he was struggling with trying to acquire donations for equipment and um, help in cutting them and stuff, we basically tried to do what we could to help him. Um, we began cutting trees on our property in March of 2012. Um, at, you know, we cut about uh, approximately 60 trees down that were on the ground and uh, two months had passed by and in that time uh, we made one attempt to try to get that timber out of the forest we had uh, you know a machine and a truck and a trailer that was able to come to the back of the property uh, that trailer was loaded with some logs and when the truck tried to get out they were unable to get out of the forest due to the sandy soil conditions and they got stuck and so we offloaded the trailer, and at that point it just sort of stalled. You know, we're like, okay, well, what are we gonna do? We really don't have this organization, or us, really don't have the means to try to move these logs in a big way um, from the back of our property up to what is the road, and, and you know, and 
a way that trucks can get out of there. So in trying to come up with a solution and how do we move these logs off of our property and get them out to the road, um, my husband came up with the idea that essentially four by four trucks or tractors would be able to help us, you know, haul them out. And so with that, um, you know, we thought that that was a great idea that if we could have some sort of community participation in helping us pull the logs out, you know, that that would help us get them to the road in a bigger way than just us and uh, renting a machine and, and niggling and diming us with all, you know, what's required in trying to, in these cleanup efforts for this property. And so uh, with that, we developed, uh, we thought, you know, well, we can offer a cash prize to whoever can pull out the most logs, essentially, out of the forest. And so we started developing, um, you know, what we created to be the Lost Pines Log Pool uh, Burn Forest Challenge. And so with that, uh, uh, we started developing it, we put out the idea, created posters, and, and just kind of wanted to let the community know that, hey, we're trying to, in the name of utilizing these trees, we're trying to harvest them, trying to get them to the road so that we can exchange them out for lumber so that we can rebuild. And so uh, from the time we came up with the idea to the time we had the event was six weeks. So in six weeks' time, uh, we developed it, we got it out there enough to where when Memorial Weekend came of 2012, um, we ended up having 15 different participating vehicles come to our property. Um, over 90 people uh, were signed in and wavered. And, um, and yeah, we had community effort that came out and supported us in helping us move these logs uh, you know, out to our road. So what essentially the process was, was um, we had to then cut down as many trees as we could. Uh, we created a road that ran through our property that created the course for the event. So participating vehicles were able to enter the backfield of our property, um, were able to choose which, you know, out of two different lanes, they could choose to go right or left, um, they would come into the field, hook up to a log by means of winches and chains um, to their vehicle or to their tractor, and then proceeded to then pull the logs out of the forest along the road and out to the street, where then we had a neighbor who had his um, skid steer machine uh, out there stacking wood for us. So it ended up being a lot of fun, and uh, from the event we met so many new people and new neighbors and really just awesome people that who wanted to see a difference being made, who participated in the cause for the trees, because even to this day there's still so much dead standing timber in this county, and it's such a shame to watch it go to waste. And I think that people have a love for the trees here. And so to see them just rotting and falling and not being used, you know, um, affects a lot of people. And, and they feel the same way that we do about them. And so they were encouraging us, you know, to uh, move forward. So with that, the log pool, um, it was, we were able to essentially pull out 237 uh, 20-foot logs out of the forest. Uh, we estimate that to be approximately 45,000 board feet of timber that was pulled out in that weekend. Um, so the hurdles that we were still trying to get over were then now transportation of these logs to Huntsville. So uh, 130 miles with a lot of weight and not the real means to be able to do it is kind of a big task to try to overcome. We didn't have access to, you know, a semi-trailer and, and, you know, big logging equipment. All we had was like little, you know, like essentially farm equipment and tractors and then uh, hay trailers to move these logs. And so we were trying to come up with a solution in, to be able to transport them to Huntsville. So a friend of ours had put online a posting, you know, requesting shipment, essentially, of these logs to Huntsville. And from that, we were uh, contacted by uh, a, a national cable television producers who uh, thought our story was really interesting and liked the human aspect of it. 
And um, so they, you know, we basically, within a week and a half of being contacted by them, had formed um, a convoy of uh, trucks that would be able to haul these, you know, passenger trucks and trailers that would haul these logs to Huntsville. Well, once we started, like, figuring out what the cost would be if, in the transportation, how long it would take, how many logs we could actually move, in, you know, by these means to Huntsville, 130 miles away, we decided that it really wasn't in our best interest to try to do it this way. So with that, you know, we at this point had cut down approximately 300 pine trees. We had um, figured out ways to move them out to the street. We had figured out now a system of being able to transport them, but where we were going wasn't our best bet. So with that, you know, knowing that the trees were still good, that they had these blonde centers, and were still a lot of them were still wet in the middle, you know, uh, we started asking around the, to the local. There's two local mills in town, both of the in the county. Both of these mills have been in business for you know 20 to 30 years, and so we started talking to these guys and saying, hey, you know, you know, we're kind of under the impression that this this wood isn't good. What's the real story on it? Can we mill the actual trees from our property instead of doing this long transportation in exchange with Huntsville? Can we actually mill these trees? And what we got was like, yes, that there is nothing wrong with these trees, that these guys have been in business for decades in this county, and it wouldn't be that case if the trees were no good, you know? So um, we had talked to the one mill in town, and when we uh, let Logs to Lumber know that, hey, you know what, we, instead of doing this exchange, we would rather just go ahead and instead of the, the cost for transporting, just go ahead and you know, transfer that cost over to actually milling, keeping it local, supporting a local business, and doing it that way. And with that, he introduced us to another sawmill that's in Elgin. And the owner of that sawmill, um, his name's Stephen Wisterhausen. He owns a sawmill and supply in Elgin. We didn't even know he was out there. He's kind of in the, you know, in the backwoods of Elgin off of Coon Neck Road. <laughs> and, uh, and so we met him and uh, told him, you know, basically asked him the same questions. You know, we want to mill this wood. Are you, you know, can you do it? Yes, he can do it. Yes, he's willing to work with us. And so we told him, you know, okay, well, we've now lined up this TV show to come out here and help us film the transportation efforts of this timber, and we're going to bring it to you. And he was like, okay. So... On June 12th, um, we organized five trucks and trailers uh, to come to our property, along with our neighbor who, again, used his uh, skid steer to help load up these logs onto the trailers. And then at this point, we were making a 25-mile, you know, you know, transport effort. Wow. Closer. Yeah, yeah, a lot closer than the 130 miles that we'd initially intended. I think what it was was we needed to, I guess, get more confident in, in in this wood, you know, compared to what we were being told, but what we knew not to be really right. And then for it to come out of the horse's mouth that, yes, this timber is good, and yes, you can mill it, and there's nothing wrong with it. Um, I think what the overall kind of picture is as far as what we're doing is that it is not an easy task, that it is an insane amount of work. You know, when you walk up to you know, a hundred foot tall pine tree that's, you know, two foot in diameter. And, you, you know, my husband, I'm going to say him, because he's the one that's done the, you know, just a tremendous amount of work along with our friend. You know, that that's, it takes a lot of courage to even just cut down that tree. No kidding. You know, and then it takes a lot of courage to figure out, well, how are we going to move this thing, you know? And then, not only that, but then now how are we going to, you know, roll it down the highway at the same time and get it to where it needs to go? And so, I don't know, in part, I think you have to be a little bit crazy to do this, you know? But in another way, it's like the most logical and, um, I don't know, common sense thing for us to do in the position that we're in. Um, you know, currently, we're not working for doctors and lawyers anymore. We paid off our mortgage uh, with insurance money, but at the same time, we're not in a position to get another mortgage, you know? So, 
if we need, if we want a house, the best thing for us to do is to use what we have that's already paid for, essentially, you know, which is this wood. And uh, in a way, it's very much, it takes a pioneer spirit to have to go and do and attempt to do what we're doing. And uh, working with the sawmill guy, you know, he's been doing this his whole life, you know. So to him, cutting wood and moving wood, that's just what he does. But we're just a couple of kids from the suburbs, you know. So this is like totally foreign to us to be able to like go out there and do this. And um, so, so with that, yeah, we uh, started working with the sawmill and supply and Stephen and, and Elgin, and um, uh, that was Tuesday we delivered on with this convoy and five trucks we made two different hauls and delivered 77 of the 237 logs to the mill in that one day and um, you know had the TV crews out I'm not quite sure if we're gonna make the cut uh, their new season has begun so we're just kind of keeping our eye out I don't know that our story really fits the format of their television show but we'll see um, but anyways, if anything, it was, um, you know, the, uh, the catalyst that, you know, kind of got us to go, okay, well, now we have this TV crew coming, we've got to get the trucks together, we've got to figure out where we're going and how to get it there. And so it's really been an interesting process along the way. Um, you know, when the fire first happened, our prayer was that the right and divine people come into our lives to help us through this process. And I, you know, and I know that's what's happening. And I think every day we uh, find, uh, you know, are mindful of our blessings and give gratitude for them. You know, like if it hadn't been, you know, even though we didn't really do with the lo the logs to lumber organization, their exchange with Huntsville, the logs to lumber organization, the philosophy of using the trees, you know, gave us that spark to keep going. Gave us the spark to find a solution to moving the trees. Um, so, so yeah, so there was purpose in working with them, you know, and then for him to introduce us to now, you know, the sawmill guy in Elgin, and, uh, and so with what Stephen has become for us is just an amazing blessing. He understands what we're trying to do. He, um, is very supportive of it, of it encouraging of it, um, understands that by building these homes, it, what it requires. And so he is a blessing in our lives, you know, and at this point, our intentions are to build the home completely, for the most part, out of these woods. Um, so the framing of the homes will be done from these loblolly pines. Uh, the exterior of the home will be from the cedars on our property. Um, it's going to be a pier and beam foundation with the piers being uh, from the cedars. Uh, you know, like they did traditionally a hundred years ago. And they're um, still standing. And they're still standing. Yeah. Uh, you know, the pine, uh, we want to do pine on the walls, pine on the floors. And so utilize what we have as much as we can. So because we have that much of the resource available to us. And so it's a really odd situation just in general, um, you know, with the trees, the fact that you know, Stephen has told us in the 25 years that him and his dad have been in business at this old mill, we're the first people to ever come along to say, hey, we're harvesting our trees and we want to build our house out of it. We're the first people. You know, and I guess being that, you know, that these woods were protected for the most part for so long that, um, I don't know, uh, we were, the, since the fire, we were the first people to bring him you know, individuals to bring him by burned logs and to mill. And uh, since then, he's had two more people come along. Oh, that's great. But it's really weird because here he is in the county with, you know, a million and a half, two million pine trees that are dead standing, and he finds the business is slow. And so I think it's really indicative of the, our society today, the fact that you know, it's easier to go and buy a two dollar two by four at Home Depot than it is to cut down a tree, move that tree, cut that tree up, mill it, and then get it back. You know, so what we're doing here is, you know, it's very much, an, it can be overwhelming at times. Um, I don't think we knew quite what we were getting into when we started this process, but we're still like willing to like move forward and, uh, and find help along the way to keep us encouraged, and to say that you can do it. And I think, you know, Stephen is it's definitely a factor in that. 
and um, and the fact that he's right here in this county, and uh, I don't know, it's really great. We have become you know good friends with him, and um, and in the end, what I see is you know a fantastic home that is completely you know a craftsman style house, wood walls, wood floors, completely made from these wool you know these woods, and it's my understanding that this is going these are going to be unique homes you know and um, I say homes because it's us and our friends the Murphys um, our you know Cody Murphy has been with Rob along this process and helping him cut the trees move the trees and now together those guys are working at the mill and um, you know milling it all so two homes will come of it, of it right now you know, if there's other people out there that have the desire to do this, we would be willing to help them, show them the way. But so far, we haven't been able to meet anybody else who's like in the position or want to to do it. And so, I don't know, like I said, I think you have to be a little bit crazy to even attempt such a thing, but at the same time, it's what makes the most sense, you know? Well, like a wise person once said that people are brought into your life at times when you need them. Yeah. And Although you've um, you've under you've experienced great tragedy, you've definitely made lemonade out of the lemons you've been given, and yeah. it was your pioneering spirit that brought you to Bastrop to begin with, and it's definitely your pioneering and creative spirit that's pulling you out of this, and it's going to give you a wonderful home and a wonderful future. Yeah, so I yeah. think it's neat. Well, it's definitely been a, an emotional journey. Um, you know, it's one thing to go through the process of losing your home, but for me, it, it's been harder to lose my forest. Yeah. And at this point, we're looking at like a 99% loss of a forest. And so our land has totally transformed. It will never be what it was. Um, the 100 year old growth forest. Um, is gone, you know, but what will grow in its place can be just as beautiful, something new, um, and with it comes the story and a legacy of a home um, that, you know, was basically built from a fire. And um, from the ashes. From the ashes. Literally. Yeah, literally. And, uh, and, and for us, it's, it, it's, it's good to know that, you know, yes, that this resource is available to us that it, it's quality, essentially this is cabinet grade wood, you know, it's a hundred year old, old growth pine. And so, yeah, cabinets are gonna be made from it. It's it's actually too pretty to put inside of a wall, but yeah. it's what we have available at hand. And uh, yeah, this is what we're gonna build these homes from. And um, we're looking forward to that, you know, the future where we can, you know, look back on it one day and say, man, that was tough, but you know, look at us on the back end of this to be able to build a home from them and um, and have the story to tell, you know, that, that summer, you know, working at the sawmill and the yeah. house that came out of it. Modern day pioneers. Advice to other people who lost their homes in the fire. You know, I, I don't know. I'm not really one to like give advice to people as far as what they, how you come away from this situation, you know, and, and what you choose to do. Um, you know, it's because it's such an emotional toll losing your home and stuff. You know, perhaps people don't make the decisions, you know, in the moment that they would otherwise. You know, and, and so like us, I think we're just we became fixated on utilizing our trees and cleaning up this property that if we'd have really known what was ahead of us, I don't know, maybe <laughs> we would have been too scared, but we just, you know, we're like head first into things. And um, as far as the situation with the trees, you know, I know a lot of folks in the county have their back against a wall. People aren't coming and offering to buy their timber from them. And so, unfortunately, their timber is going to be cut down and taken away as a service to them and a means to help them. But And mulched. A lot of it's going into and, mulch. And mulched, you know. And and to me, it's it's sad because what we're really what we're talking about here, y'all, is old growth cabinet grade wood. But it's just this odd situation that's coupled with a timber market and... You know, an insane amount of work and time and energy, but at the same time, you know, it's such a waste, you know, and uh, it's funny, like, you know, we become this sort of green eco-culture, right? But I think a lot of that is just 
terms that are thrown around and apply to a you know dishwasher or something because when you're talking green eco and sustainable what Robert and I are doing is the essence of that we are utilizing the resources and materials on our property to build our home and our and our shelter which has happened since the beginning of time you know man goes out and looks you know what does he have available to him he creates shelter from that whether it be clay dirt rocks you know or wood and so I think what we're doing is really just an essence of that desire to shelter yourself but at the same time you know use what it is that you have around you fortunately in today's modern times we have tractors yeah. we have trucks we have chainsaws you know um, but yeah it's just it's I don't know it's it's an odd situation and I think yeah. it's it kind of is it's indicative of our society you know in the fact that it's so much easier to just go up to the store and and buy a piece of wood, of wood not knowing what it took to get that wood to the store you know yeah. and here we've had you know approximately three home shows green shows product shows here in Bastrop talking about rebuilding and, and people building their homes and using green eco-friendly you know appliances or materials to do it but in all of that home building and home talking, no one ever talked about using your trees. You know, that, that subject never came up and there wasn't anybody encouraging people to use their trees. And so, I don't know. So what we're doing is kind of unique and weird, but at the same time, it's what's most common sense and what's most, I don't know, real or uh, primitive in, in wanting to shelter yourself, you know? Yeah. So here we are. <laughs> Thank you so much for sitting here and talking with me. I've appreciated hearing the full story. I've known a lot of it, but now I know the full story. Thank well, you, Well, thank you for having this conversation with me, and uh, I'm glad to share my story, and, and I hope on the back side of this, you know, that um, good comes from it, and a home, and um, a story that we can be proud of, and be able to, and, you know, share with our kids in the, in the time that, you know, what we've been through and then what we can say came out of it and uh yeah your family will have stories for a long time about <laughs> this, this is for sure <laughs> thank you thank you